Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Hello and welcome everybody to the next reading of the Divine Program of the World's History, a book by Albert Close. And today we are on a second reading we've done for the day. Yerk and I met this morning here in America and over there in Belgium. It was in the afternoon, and now it's evening over there, Yerk. And wow, a very profound bit of study that we did in the book of Revelation chapter 16 this morning. And now we are going to continue in a deeper analysis of the reading of Revelation 16, verses 1 through 21, I believe. So, thank you, Yerk, for being with us and, and reading with us and helping us come to some kind of um, overview of this uh, portion of the book of the Divine Program of the World's History. This is a very critical uh, piece of uh, prophetic scripture that we're looking at today. Yeah, thank you, Brett, and uh, thank you for doing this reading with me. Thank you for finding the book in the first place. Uh, My pleasure. It, scanning it. Uh, did you scan this as a PDF? 
Or yes, did I you did. Find it on yes. The yeah, I thought no, so. No, 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 no. So you did all you did all that work, and I'm so glad yeah. that we did this. That we do this book reading together, sometimes uh, with our brother Michael. Um, this evening, it is for me. It is a Sabbath evening. For Brett, it is a Sabbath afternoon. Normally, we are occupied doing a Bible study with our brother in Christ, Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. But since he has a little. Uh, Interference from his health, uh, a tooth infection or something, he is not able to join us in our Bible study, which is a shame on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, Brett and I never do the Bible study alone, because we always do this with three, and so we don't want to advance our study and leave Tom behind or any other, any other, anyone else behind when he cannot participate in the study. So whenever one is... Um, uh, not present. Not, not present that day. We don't do a Bible study. We do something else. So I told Brett, let's go back into the book reading. And this afternoon, in the in the last uh, reading we did this afternoon on my time, mm -hmm. I already said that we are going to analyze a little bit deeper what the author said because the author let us read most of the part of Revelation chapter 16, and then afterwards he gave an analysis of the meaning of the verses. So that is also kind of a Bible study. But in the book, it was first reading the verses and then doing the analysis. And I want to put them um, one against the other, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we are doing a kind of a Bible study today, but not in the subject that we are normally doing with Tom Press. So we are doing this reading, continuing this reading, but we are co focusing first on the Bible part that is in there. And I'm so glad that Brett found this book and scanned this book and um, put it on archive.org for our convenience to download it. I probably should do the same. I should also uh, upload that on my archive.org. Mm -hmm. uh, but I won't do that this weekend because this weekend is uh, probably going, the, going to be the release of Rulers, in Evil, uh, Rulers of Evil in German. Nice. The, com the complete book. I expect that to be uh, ready to publish tomorrow. Uh, Sunday, that is, and then I will put that up directly on archive.org and announce that everywhere, and I don't want to um, overlap this book with uh, Rulers of Evil in German, uh, understandably. So then I will probably wait another week. I just didn't do it before because I didn't think of the fact that I could put that on my archive.org but then there are more places for people to download this wonderful book the divine history uh, the divine program of the world's history from albert close the one we are reading now and uh, so after this little introduction i hope that you are with us and that you will enjoy as much as we uh, continue reading in this book um, the divine program of the world's history and gain a better understanding of chapters in the Revelation that I personally have never studied. I mean, I have never read chapter 16. Uh, and even the chapters that I read, I don't have a complete understanding of. Even not chapter 17 or 18, which are the most read probably, and even chapter 13, there are still some things that aren't um, perfectly clear, at least not in my understanding. I don't know about oh, you. Very much, Shirk. It's it's true. There's a lot to take in. And certainly, it, it just makes me think of, well, what does our Lord have to say about it? it it's just, it's beyond men's words. It's, I mean, the Lord teaches us in his due, due time, in his due season, I believe, you know, when we're ready for it. Mm -hmm. And not beforehand, unless you know um, special instances are, or um, you know, it's it's really his revelation. It's not ours, you know, because our natural man, the natural man, knows not the things of God because you know they're spiritually discerned. We have to seek it out. We have to work it out. It takes a lot of time. There are things that need to be done beforehand. Before you even get the time to, to consider, you know, and mm -hmm. it's Bible learning. You know, the whole world has been basically against Bible learning from the beginning. So, no surprises, I guess. It says in the very beginning of the book of Revelation that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So. Yes. That's right. The whole book is his word. He is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. 
it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's that simple, mm -hmm. you know? It really is. Um, without Jesus, there's nothing of importance anywhere. <laughs> uh, not in this world, not in another world that is to come, that is not here yet. The kingdom of God is here already, because he said the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here already. There are many, many inhabitants in that kingdom of God. But it is a kingdom that you cannot see, that you cannot feel, that you cannot touch, that you cannot smell. It is a spiritual kingdom. And if you want to belong to that kingdom, you got to know, uh, you got to read the instructions how to get there. And the instructions are his word, and that is the Bible. And I have been doing a lot of Bible study the past years, by far, far, far not the amount that I should have done, mea culpa, I can say, but, okay, I did other things, and I have a interesting learning curve behind me that brought me to where I am today, and uh, I am here today also because I'm reading this wonderful book from Albert Close from the beginning of the 20th century, and it is now today an evening where I'm going to busy myself with Revelation chapter 16 that I haven't even read before, that's going to be very interesting and going to explain a few things to us a little bit better. And I don't say, listen, this is very important and Brett is 100% supporting me in this. What the author says here in this book is what the author says in this book. It is not what Jesus Christ says. Maybe he says the same as Jesus Christ. Maybe his explanation is completely correct. I don't know. I want to know how the author explains Revelation chapter 16 and its fulfillment in this earth. That's why we are going to do this little study of chapter 16 as he put it in the book. And as I read last time, this time we go a little bit deeper into it. But never, ever, ever forget what Albert Close writes in his book is Albert Close. It is not Jesus Christ. So you always have to take it with a grain of salt and discernment and see if these things are really so. You have to prove it uh, against the Bible. And probably there are other places in the Bible that will whether confirm or reject what Albert Close writes here. Because the Bible always explains itself, right? So therefore right. you need multiple points in the Bible to confirm that that one point that you read you have the complete understanding of. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that I am far from perfect. Brett is as far from perfect as I am. And you who listens to this and watches this is probably as far away from perfect as we are. So we only have our carnal understanding of the Bible. And we try to understand the spiritual message of the Bible. That's also what Albert Close does. He tries to understand what is spiritually meant by the words that Jesus Christ put in Revelation chapter 16. But this is by no means a dogmatic Bible teaching. This is a study, and we try to gain, with the help of the author Albert Close, a deeper understanding of the subject. And that is all. Point. Blank. Full stop. Okay? So don't say, oh, Jörg said this and this on that. No, no, I don't say anything. I'm reading this book and I try to understand and I try to extract as much wisdom out of the book of Albert Close as I try to extract from the book of Revelation, chapter 16, which we are reading. And I try to um, improve my understanding of the Bible, my wisdom of the Word of God, by reading the Word of God and use this book from Albert Close as a study tool, but I nor Brett, we are not teaching that what we are reading now, regarding chapter 16 of Revelation, is the truth. The only thing that is the unbridled truth that we are going to read are the words of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 16. If the analysis that Albert Close does is the correct analysis, so be it, so the better. We all gain something, but we are not dogmatic about his explanation. And whether it is from Albert Close alone, or it comes from Henry Gretton Guinness, or it comes from E.B. Elliot, uh, Elliot, or it comes from Wordsworth, or all the other guys 
that uh, Albert Close put together in the writing of his book, I don't care, the only thing that counts is the word of God in the Holy Bible, uh, preferably the authorized version of the 1611 King James Bible. You agree with me, Brad, right? Yes, absolutely. I knew that. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so let's go into this book after we've established this and that you understand that we are just trying to get a deeper understanding with the help of Albert Close. And the point is, and I'm going to make this as the last point before we go into the reading, this is why I don't read the Geneva Bible, whether the Bible for 15, uh, of 1560 or the Bible of 1599 or any other Bible with footnotes, because the footnotes are always notes men put in there. Any man puts in there or has put in there in the past. And I don't want to read the notes of men. I want to read the notes of God. I have that much experience in my almost 53 years of my life here on this earth today that I know that I can trust no man. And by the way, the Bible says exactly that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You got it, Jörg. So, the only, <laughs> the only man I trust is Jesus Christ and his word. And now let's go into the analysis of the book. We are on page 105 in the PDF, or accordingly, page 122 in the book. Armageddon possibly to be an era of wars. And we are starting in the middle of the page, where Albert Close, after reading the first 21 verses of the book of Revelation, chapter 16, he says... According to the views of our recognized standard interpreters of the prophetic scriptures, yeah? <laughs> you see what it starts with already? Mm. Mm. According to the views of our recognized standard interpreters. So that's not Jesus Christ, right? Those are men who are quote unquote standard interpreters of prophetic scripture. Of the historical school, well, that's wonderful that, of course, we are doing the historical school, otherwise, I wouldn't even have bothered to open this book. <laughs> <laughs> because, <laughs> Bravo. because next to historical school, you only have the preterist school, which is Jesuitical, and you have the futurist school, which is also Jesuitical. The only true school is the historical school. But we are relying here on, quote-unquote, recognized standard interpreters of the prophetic scriptures. We are not relying on Jesus Christ alone. Again, just to make that point more solid that I made a few minutes ago. Our position chronologically at the present time, speaking of the beginning of the 20th century to understand, in the great divine program set forth in the book of Revelation is approximately chapter 16, verse 12. The preceding verses, so that means chapter 1 through 12, or through 11, these preceding verses in this chapter are generally regarded as referring to the era of the Great French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars which grew out of that revolution. So, let's go into the King James Bible and read verses 1 and 2, because verse 2 is explained here, verse 1 is not. The King James Bible reads, chapter 16 of Revelation, And I heard a great voice out of the temple, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways! and put out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Let me just put a picture of the book in here. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Verse 2, the author explains, is supposed to refer to the dreadful outbreak of social and moral evil which accompanied that great revolutionary movement. Let's go a little bit down here, put the picture back up there. I'm sorry for these technical issues. Now let's go into verse 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Of course, when we do a little Bible study and Bible understanding here, Brett, I think it is correct when we say that in prophetic terms, sea is speaking of tongues, multitudes mm -hmm. of nations, and many, many people, right? That's right. 
So, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. So, that is upon many people. Yeah, that's said in the Bible, actually, what you just said. Yeah, that is an explanation. Multitudes, nations, and tongues, I believe it is, somewhere. Yeah, that is Revelation chapter 17, brother. Yeah, and I just want to quick mention, you know, if anyone ever wants to ask a question about their Bible, they should learn how to do a search with a search engine. I don't care which search engine you use. Just find a a good, simple King James search engine and type in whatever your heart desires and study it. It's fascinating. That's correct. Good point you make there, brother. Mm -hmm. And of course, eSort is a kind of a tool that can help many people. Oh, yeah. It's worth the, if you have to spend a little money to get it, it's worth every penny. Well, don't normal, hesitate. Normally, eSort brother is available for free on the internet. Ah, uh, unless you're on a Mac, it costs ten bucks. Okay, I don't know about that, but I have it here on my Windows computer, and I download it for free on the internet. So, yep. but I'm not, I'm not very, uh, I'm not very good dealing with that eSort. I'm, I'm, uh, I have troubles with the search engine and all that stuff, and. You know, yeah, I'm, you know, that's ah. interesting you bring that up. On the PC, it's much more technically advanced than the Mac, I think, in some ways. And, um, yeah, they simplified it on the Mac. I think the Mac is more of a platform for, for people that don't like computers. <laughs> <laughs> right, but I, should have I don't know if that Mac makes then. any sense at all. <laughs> but to some it does, to some it doesn't. But uh, I've been on a Mac for so many years, I can't even... I think I was, what, 14 years old or something, or maybe even younger when we got our first Apple. And now you're, what, 18 or something? What's that? (laughs) (laughs) 18? Yeah, right. (laughs) No. Uh, Let's just have a little fun here and there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, right. No, 5-0, man. Yeah, I know. Okay, so... Um, verse 3, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And the sea is, when you read Revelation chapter 17, in one of the verses it explains, because the Revelation 17 starts out with the woman that, uh, that um, uh, or no, it, it's Revelation chapter 13 that speaks about the beast coming out of the sea. And in, se- in Revelation chapter 17 it is explained that the sea um, is a synonym for multitudes of tongues and languages and people and nations. Huh? So, and the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every little uh, living soul died in the sea. The author mm. explains, verse 3, to the great naval wars which swept the navies of the papal countries of Europe off the sea during the same period. So, he is taking the sea literally when speaking about naval wars on the one hand, but on the other hand, he is speaking about war and bloodshed, and that means that many people died. Okay. Ooh, comment. Yeah, yeah please, and please. every living soul, Yerk, I'm thinking every soul that was written with their name in the Book of Life. Uh, only those are living souls. The other ones are dead. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Spiritually dead in trespasses dead. and sins. We all are dead in trespasses and sins. Until Jesus Christ. But we Christ. find new life in Jesus Christ. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. So, that's verse 3. Let's go to verse 4. The, uh, the Bible says, And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. The author explains verse 4 as the following. To Napoleon's battles fought on the banks of the Alpine rivers, and on those Italian, Austrian, and German rivers fed by these mountain streams. These rivers were almost literally dried red with human blood during those campaigns they had also been scenes of papal persecution. Verses 5, 6, and 7 is what we are going to read next. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, 
and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. The author explains verses 5, 6 and 7 accordingly by saying, These verses inform us that this dreadful bloodshed was retribution on papal lands because of past persecutions of God's people. Verse 8 reads, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And the explanation in Albert Close's book reads, verse 8, to the overturning of the thrones of Europe by Napoleon. Verse 9 he seems to leave out, so we are going to read verse 9 and verse 10 together. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. The author explains to us that verse 10, to the plundering of Rome and dethronement of the Pope by the French in 1798 through 1809. Rome was the seat of the beast. Rome is the seat of the Antichrist still today. So there is no explanation of verse 11, so we go directly into verse 12. The Bible says, And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. The author explains to us on verse 12, to the drying up of the Turkish empire by the continuous breaking away of provinces. Since the year 1827, Greece, the Balkan provinces, which is in later terms for the European folks to understand or the American folks to understand better, countries like Yugoslavia, that has been split up into Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and so on, all these little countries, those are the Balkan provinces, Algeria and Egypt have all broken away from Turkey, meaning, or actually saying, from the Ottoman Empire. During the 19th century, the Turkish Empire lost over half of its territory. We are going to remember that we read earlier in this book about the Edict of Toleration from 1844 that started the decline of the Ottoman Empire and that came to a total stop of the power of the Ottoman Empire at the end of World War I in 1919, 75 years later. And you know, remember that 75 years was the difference between solar years and um, uh, prophetic years, right? If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, something like that. Mm. There, was a, uh, there was a difference between these 75, and there was exactly 75 years. And from 1844 through 1919, you have 75 years. Okay. Oh, it was between solar and lunar, I think. So, yeah, right? Solar and lunar, yeah, or, or, or solar and uh, calendar year. So that's yeah. one of the two. I, I don't know exactly anymore. But that's not important. Important is that you just remember we read this few uh, broadcasts earlier and that you rem remember that we already spoke about the declinement of the Ottoman Empire that started in 1844 with the Edict of Toleration and ended in 1919 after the First World War when the whole Ottoman Empire was split into pieces by the Entente, by the winning powers of the First World War. <coughs> So, in 1876, Turkey became bankrupt. And then the author continues and says, verses 13 through 21, to future tremendous social and political convulsions, and probably to the times of trouble through which we are now passing in A.D. 1916. So, we are going to read the verses 13, 21 with the understanding or with the trying to understand of something that even the author doesn't understand because he lives in 1916. That means that this book has not been finished 
until the end of World War I. Then we had a little pause, according to um, Marshal Fock, who was the Allied leader of the soldiers of, of the Entente in the, in the First World War, and his brother was a high Jesuit, and he himself was Jesuit trained, he said in 1919 that we will not have a peace treaty, but a 20-year truce. And after that 20 years gone by, 1939, the Second World War broke out. And directly after the Second World War, you have the Korean War, you have the Vietnam War, and you have all the other kinds of wars, even until today, that quote-unquote war against terrorism, that mm. war against the Islamic world, that war that is a patsy war, exactly the same way as the quote-unquote Cold War between 1945 and 1990 was only a substitute war. It was only a war in the minds of the people. It was not a war that was really fought because it was all a show. It is all a Jesuitical theater. So from what we are reading now, verses 13 through 21, the author will not give us any explanation as he gave for the first verses, but he says that these, is, that these are probably verses dealing with the time after 1916. So now we, with our historical understanding, have to try to discern what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 21, and put this in relation to the quite frequent history of the last 100 years. 2019 we have today, 1919 was the end of the First World War, or 1918 if you want, don't put me on a few months there, because it was in November 1918. So we are speaking about the last 100 years. Let's see if we can understand from that point of view the Bible in Revelation chapter 16 in a good point. All right? What does the Bible say? And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Uh, therefore, it is already interesting to understand who are those three entities the author of the Bible speaks about. Three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. We know from Revelation chapter 12 that the dragon, that great dragon, is the snake, the serpent, is the devil. Okay? Mm -hmm. Satan. And out of the mouth of the beast. Okay, what beast? Well, in Revelation chapter 13 we have two beasts. We have the beast that comes out of the sea, which is explained in Revelation 17, that the sea is multitudes of tongues and nations. And we have the second beast. I, for myself, have not yet established what the second beast is. The overall understood teaching in this world is that the second beast is the, beast of, is the nation of the United States of America. I personally do not believe that anymore, but I need to do a deeper study of Revelation chapter 13 to really understand that the Vatican, that is the kingdom of the Vatican, this little piece of, I just wanted to say S-H-I-T, um, you know, this little piece of dirt <laughs> in Rome, that that is one beast, and that the Roman Catholic Church is the other beast, because when you read Rulers of Evil from F. Tapasorsi in the very beginning, the, in the very first quote he uses for the first chapter to start with, that is a quote that comes from uh, Bishop Creighton. That's a Roman Catholic bishop. And that Creighton, that bishop says, quote, the Roman Catholic Church is a state, unquote. So when the Roman Catholic Church is a state, and the Vatican is a state, and a state, a nation, is a beast, it could very well be that the Vatican is one beast, and the Roman Catholic Church is the other. I don't say it is so. I say I need more discernment. I need more Bible study. I just don't want to walk the path everybody walks on.
because the broad path leads into perdition. Ooh, I comment. don't want to follow the masses, and the masses follow the teaching of the quote-unquote established church like the SDA, to name one for example, that teaches all over the world that the second beast is the United States of America. I do not want to go down that path without any further study. Please, Brett. Thank you, Yerk. I have to agree with you 100%. I think your analysis is spot on. But like you said, it doesn't hurt to do more research and get more specific about what the Bible is trying to tell us. And I'll tell you, though, uh, history repeats itself. And uh, yeah, it could be interpreted that the United States is the second beast. But it's like what Yerk said, we have to study it very carefully and to understand a very clear picture of what the Bible is trying to tell us in Revelation 13. And yes, I think it doesn't hurt to get yourself in the ballpark of looking at the, the uh, nations, uh, multitudes of nations and tongues being Europe and the beast coming out of the, the wilderness being the United States, had two horns like a lamb, spake as a dragon, but it could just be a mirror of what's already happened in the past. So I think what Yerk just said is very profound, and it's not so easy to accept. So just well, take it slow. <laughs> let me just say, Brad, when the Bible speaks in Revelation chapter 13 of the second beast that has two horns like a lamb but spake as a mm -hmm. dragon, isn't, isn't that a wonderful story what the Roman Catholic Church did? The Roman Ooh. Catholic Church formed itself out of real Christianity. Then Emperor Constantine took yes. the pagan Roman Empire and embraced Christianity. And yes. all of a sudden, the lamb spake as a dragon. Isn't that true? Yes, Jörg. I think it just, it's just maybe important to recognize that the deeper aspects of learning what the Bible's trying to tell us clearly take a lot of study. And really, it depends on your conscience. Sometimes our consciences are captive with other things and we can't grasp it. So it, it just takes a long time to consider things. And we're just telling people, you know, uh, just consider it. Don't, don't take us for our word for it. We're just considering it ourselves, and we're sharing that with you. Right, Yerk? Yeah, the point is, Brett, as I made already in the beginning of this broadcast, that we are not teaching Biblically, yeah, it's not dogma. That's but that, right. But, but that we are trying to get to a better understanding. And when mm -hmm. I see it, you, you know, the problem the problem is that I have, when everybody teaches it, it doesn't mean that it is true. That's right. That's even, right. The, even the apostles of Jesus Christ missed out because yes, they, they thought that he wanted to establish the kingdom of God on this earth physically. Of course. They were looking for a... Um, dominion of the kingdom of Christ here on earth and that's not what he did do he didn't free the Jews from the Roman oppression as the scribes and the Pharisees and all the Jews wanted and expected him to do he came to save all men from their sins so that they could live in eternity together with him as a reborn Christian when they accept him and when they accept his sacrifice on the cross in Calgary that he did. Everybody was wrong at that time. Even the apostles in the beginning, when they were called disciples still, didn't understand what Jesus Christ, his message was all about when he came. That's why he uh, again and again and again and again spoke in parables to them. To make them understand, listen, this is what I'm saying. Not with your eyes, not with your hands, not with your noses. You can, you can see, touch, smell the kingdom of God. But with your spirit, you got to go there. Don't put treasures on this earth. Put your treasure where your heart is. Put it in heaven where no rust nor thief can get it. That's what he that said. That is what he taught the people. That is what they still didn't get after three and a half years of him roaming this earth and preaching the kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. 
And why should we be so different today? Why should all of a sudden all the people get it? Why should all of a sudden all Christians understand Revelation chapter 13, speaking of the first piece as the Vatican and the second piece of the United States of America, everyone gets it? Well, I'm very much afraid when everyone gets it. When history shows again and again and again that nobody yes. ever got it. I think you're really on to something, Jörg. It's true. It's true. The more we study history, the more it comes to light. And I think that's really the essence of it, Jörg, is that we haven't studied history enough. The point, on the other hand, Brett, is that we can only understand revelation that the Holy Spirit really reveals to us. And I cannot name a better example than our brother who cannot join us tonight, Tom Fress, mm -hmm. who had a real teaching of the of the uh, of the Holy Spirit years ago when he was an evening on his work studying his Bible and all of a sudden he understood Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 all of a sudden he got the revelation from the Holy Spirit that it was not the Antichrist that Daniel was speaking about but it was Jesus Christ that Daniel was speaking about Something the whole world does teach opposite. All of a sudden, he got it. And what did it make him? It made him a teacher of the fulfilled 70th week of Daniel, of the complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27. And ever since, he is preaching against the choir. He is preaching against all established churches. He is preaching against all the quote-unquote knowledge of Christians. He stands alone, but he stands on the rock that is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you that. So the point is, I'm not saying that Revelation chapter 13 speaks about the Vatican in the first and Roman Catholic Church in the second place. I am just putting out there the possibility that we should try to see it like that and then try to gain an understanding. Because, sorry, we are busy with the book of Revelation here. I mean, to my understanding, this is the most difficult book of the whole Bible. Because it deals in a time that we are living in, people. Yes. When we are reading Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all the prophets of the Old Testament, so-called, of the of law and the prophets, this is all fulfilled. We can look back into history and we can see the fulfillment of every prophecy they said. And we see that's what they spoke about. That's what happened. We can measure it to actual facts when we at least get the real history, not the Jesuitical history, and we see the fulfillment of all the prophecies in the past, but we cannot see the fulfillment of the prophecies of five years or ten years ago. Uh, who says that, who tells you that somewhere in Revelation, uh, Jesus Christ did not speak about 9-11? I don't know. I, 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 if he spoke about it, I don't know where. I for sure want to find out if he did. And it is so hard to understand yeah. the past that is just in the last few years and seeing that the history of the world, and we are reading the <laughs> divine program of yeah. the world's history, <laughs> the world's history is 6,000 years old. So when you only focus on the last 100 years or even the last 50 years with this tiny little understanding that is given to us, it is freaking hard to yes, make ends is. meet in that regard. Mm -hmm. It is freaking hard to stand there and say, that's what the Bible says, and that's the way it's fulfilled in 1945, in 1923, in 1916, in 1976, in 2001. I don't know. I, 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 can't, I can't do that from the point yes, where I'm here right now. But I'm telling you, we have to try to when we study the whole Bible, to understand that things that we read in one chapter are explained whether in the chapter before where it doesn't make any sense that you read it, or in the chapter past, uh, in, a, in a later chapter, 
that you have to go back with your mind. And the best example is when it speaks about the sea, and only in Revelation chapter 17 it is explained that the sea are multitudes of tongues, nations, and people. What sense does that make to you all of a sudden when you then go back and read chapter 13? When you have that understanding. Then you can put the the, 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 the nail to the donkey, or how do you say that? Sure, yeah. sure. Pin the, you, pin the nail on the donkey and also put the puzzle pieces back together and form a picture which actually becomes very clear. And all of a sudden makes sense, things that didn't yeah. make sense before. That's right. Right. And, and this is the problematic, the, <laughs> the problem that we are dealing with here today. When the yes, author yes. tells us that verse 13 through 21 deal with, from his point of view, 1916 onwards, future events, for us in 2019 with recent historical events, how much of the real history do we actually know? And how good is our Bible discernment? To measure the things happened during the last 100 years and to put the nail on the donkey <laughs> yeah. to say this happened that year and this is what Revelation 16 verse, I don't know, speaks about. This is the problem that we have here. And it is not the problem that Brett and I have in this broadcast. It is the problem that everybody has who listens to this and takes picks up his own study to see and study his Bible and to be a good Berean and study the Bible daily and to see if those things were so or are so and measure everything that happened the last 100 years to the prophetic words written in Revelation chapter 16. Presuming, now it comes, that the author is correct in his first analysis with the first 12 verses and with his presumption, because that's all that it is, that Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 through 21, deal with the history from his point of view to be fulfilled within the next years. Meaning, our last 100 years that we look back on upon today. Interesting, huh? <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Very interesting, yes. So, chapter 16, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs. So, the Bible tells us, and I cannot pinpoint where, what <laughs> frogs stand for. You can go oh, yeah. into the Bible and learn what frogs stand for. Yep, there's that search engine. Use it. <laughs> 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 and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. We know for sure that the dragon is Satan. Revelation chapter 12 verse 9. And out of the mouth of the beast. And we can almost with 100% certainty speak of this one beast. That it is the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. That is the Vatican. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now who is the false prophet? Well, to my understanding, but that's only me, a name like the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, all deal with one and the same person, in one and the same office, let's say, the office of the papacy. It is very well possible that also the false prophet is meant by that, because what is the, pa the, the papacy. What is the Pope otherwise but a false prophet who teaches another gospel to the people and by that leading them astray from the real gospel? Of course, you can also say, oh, but the false prophet, that is Protestantism. Well, I don't know. Protestantism is not a person. <laughs> In the, Bible, right. <laughs> in the Bible, you can point to the man of sin as the Pope. Bang! Out. In the Bible, you can point to the son of perdition as the Pope. Bang! Point. That person. That's it. But you cannot point to Protestantism and say, uh, that's Luther? That's Calvin? Mm. That's ah. 
Wycliffe, that's Tyndale, that's Latimer, that's Mortimer, that's Ridley, that's Scott, that's Knox, Yerk. that's Zwingli. How about the body of Christ? Uh, also not a one person, brother. No, of course not. <laughs> But, but the, the body of Christ, not but, one but, person but body, either. No, but the body of <laughs> but, but but the body of Christ is um, is his church here and uh, is is yeah. part of many of many of many parts. Yeah, so yes, many parts true. fill this one body. So I'm just saying that this false prophet, when you speak mm. of this false prophet, no, that's true. You know, he speaks here of um, the dragon. One person, Satan. He speaks of the mouth of the beast that stands for the Vatican. That is that one nation. And out of the false prophet. So that also must stand for, in my understanding, and hey, I'm not dogmatic, I'm just telling you all. I understand this. This stands also for one institution one can really pinpoint to. Because you can pinpoint to the Vatican and you point to the Pope. You can pinpoint to the dragon and you point to Satan, that spirit, yeah, that fallen angel. And the false prophet, you can also say, well, the false prophet is maybe Protestantism. You can say the false prophet is maybe Islam. You can also say the false prophet maybe is Buddhism, because it also leads you away from Christianity, doesn't it? Hinduism leads you away from Christianity, doesn't it? Shamanism leads you away from the Bible, doesn't it? Who is the false prophet? There are many different possibilities who the false prophet actually is. And I think, that's my personal opinion, the false prophet is just another name for the Pope. Because he leads people astray. He leads people away from the knowledge of Jesus Christ, from the knowledge of the Bible. He falsifies the Bible. He forbids the Bible reading. He falsely explains the verses of the Bible. He misinterprets them. He misuses them. He uses them for themselves to elevate to, to himself, to elevate himself above all that is called God. Second Thessalonians chapter two. This verse I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. You That's know, right? Mm -hmm. So it is possible Surely. that the Pope is the false prophet. Okay, And we are dealing with the history of the last 100 years. Who did we have to deal with? Didn't we have to deal in 1962 through 1965 with the Second Vatican Council? Mm -hmm. Didn't we have to deal then with false prophecy? Mm -hmm. Didn't we have to deal then with the policy of the Roman Catholic Church calling all quote-unquote Protestant denominations back under her wings? Come back to Mama! Share the full communion with a beast or else. Isn't that a false prophecy teaching? Just putting that out there. Use your own discernment. I'm not teaching. I'm asking questions. For they are spirits of devils. Working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Okay. So, the three unclean spirits, like frogs, are the spirits of devils. Speaking of devil in plural, I understand as speaking of the, de uh, of the spirit of the devil and his fallen angels. That's how I understand this. Working miracles. <laughs> um, what about the story they tell you of the atomic bomb that does not exist? What about the story of flying to the moon that they didn't do? What about all these stories uh, of this collapsing to towers by jet fuel of few planes? Isn't that a miracle? that these two towers fell in free fall speed because of a few liters of kerosene? Isn't that working miracles? Isn't it working miracles when you have the Mary apparitions starting in 1917, which is one year after Albert Close published his book in 1916, and you have the Fatima 
uh, Mary uh, apparition there, telling the people to go to war against Russia, to exterminate the Orthodox Church. What did they do in World War II with the erection of the NDH, the uh, 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 sovereign nation state of Croatia, killing almost a million Serbs in Serbia? What was that? The Germans going against Russia, killing so many Russians on the way there, and of course, eradicating the Orthodox Church, which is a thorn in the eye of the Pope ever since the schisma of 1054. Working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, <laughs> meaning under all the presidents of the United States of America, under all the chancellors of Germany, under all the presidents of the United Kingdom of England, under all the presidents of Canada and all the other countries in the world that we have, all the political rulers. So these spirits of devils work miracles on the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Wow, is this an interesting study. Behold, the Bible says, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Ooh. Now, this is a direct, a direct warning not to become like Adam. Because Adam lost his garments when he fell, when he disobeyed God. He walked naked, he covered his shame, but he couldn't. And that's why God prepared a skin of animal for him. Become, I, uh, behold, I come as a thief. This is Jesus Christ speaking, because this is the book of Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, as he says in the very beginning of chapter 1. Behold, I come as a thief. Jesus Christ, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches. What do you need to watch out? You need the Holy Bible, you need the Word of God, you need to know it, you need to read it, you need to study it, you need to understand it, and you have to watch for the enemy, and therefore you have to know who the enemy is, you have to know that the enemy is not the future Antichrist, but that the papacy is, was, and always will be the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Watch out, and don't fall off the faith of Jesus Christ, don't be disobedient to Jesus Christ's laws, because otherwise you walk naked, you have no protection. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Take on the whole armor of God. And when you walk naked, when you have no protection, you see his shame. I, I, I don't think, Brett, that we are going to go all through Revelation chapter yes, 16 today. You're, that's really interesting. I'm thinking in terms of righteousness and wickedness. You yeah. know, yeah, your shame. Adam, Adam lost your shame his righteousness. All the wicked things you've done in this life. You know, we need to have the garment with Christ and to be able to be enough of a man to admit to Christ alone. You know, I think that's something we're all capable of doing, certainly. But the question is, are we that responsible or not? So, it takes a lot of time to learn these things in the Bible, Yerk. They don't come overnight, that's for sure. No, oh, that's for sure. Listen, brother, it was interesting, but I think we are on about... Uh, on the broadcast on one hour. Perfect. And it was so intense, at least to me. Mm -hmm. that I, <laughs> I need oh, a yeah, break. me too. Absolutely <laughs> I, I, right. I, I, I need a break. And I want to continue this next time, maybe with the last verses. Uh, we still have five or so to, or so to go. 
uh, to understand Revelation chapter 16, but uh, this was so intense and so interesting uh, that I want to call it quits here for the moment. And uh, thank you very much Good for idea. the invitation. Uh, thank yes. you very much for the invitation, Brett, and uh, just uh, welcome. close it thank down you for, for today. Right? Thank you for guiding us through the reading, Yerk, and, and, and you know, becoming a vessel for Christ and, and allowing His Spirit to just dwell in, in that. You know, these studies are so very important because if we get something wrong and we, built, we build on a lie, we're in trouble. You know, this is such an important verse that we're closing on. Uh, yeah, the garments, Yerk. We've got to keep our garments with Christ. He's the only one that's worthy of eternal life. Because in this flesh, we're all born in trespasses and sins. And we've all fallen short. And there will be no hierarchy. There will be no hierarchy. Thank God for that. There will either be standing in righteousness, or there will be a fiery death in wickedness. Which one you want? I think I'll choose the righteous path. How about you? With that, we end our broadcast today. We'll catch up with you next time. Blessings in our Lord Jesus Christ. Till then, Maranatha. Bye-bye. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil, one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother, and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law, and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, We will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy, and sell, and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. <laughs>